Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. I'm Chris Cottrell, and this is part seven of my presentation on the formation of Carolina Bays. Um, this part will be focusing on the late Pleistocene megafaunal extinction event as a line of evidence pointing towards a cometary impact into the Laurentide Ice Sheet at what is now known as Saginaw Bay of the Great Lakes region. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about here, um, I highly suggest clicking on the link above and starting the series from the beginning. You know, we've been covering a lot of ground here and I feel like we are really starting to connect the dots. You know, and speaking of connecting the dots, um, every time <laughs> I'm ready to put out a new video, something else comes out that is heavily related to this topic, you know, which is great. This means that our, you know, this topic is really picking up steam or breaking new ground. Uh, and, and just a few days ago, I was introduced to a very interesting podcast or audio journal, which I love, um, as the Seven Ages Research Team calls them. Uh, their most recent audio journal is about the Younger Dryas uh, with George Howard. And you may recall that I, I credited George by name for his work with the Comet Research Group during my last video. And I want to make sure that I provide a link to the Seven Ages website, you know, right here above. Uh, and I'll put it in the description below. And I highly suggest that you guys go check them out. You know, it's a great podcast. They have a great format. Go check them out. Now, as I mentioned in one of my previous videos, the Pleistocene Epoch, you know, the Epoch right before the one that we're in now, which is the Holocene, uh, was really the rise of the extra large mammals. Megafauna, as they're called, refers to any animal over 100 pounds as an adult. Um, what I didn't mention was that the Pleistocene, and especially the late Pleistocene, was also the fall of most of these mega mammals. You know, please keep in mind that the Pleistocene Epoch lasted for, you know, over two and a half million years. And all of the animals that we are about to talk about survived multiple ice ages. Um, but they did not survive the most recent ice age. Um, I also want to point out that the rise of our own species, Homo sapiens, also occurred during the Pleistocene Epoch. And whatever, you know, or I'm sorry, we are also considered to be megafauna. You know, we are over 100 pounds as adults. And so whatever events occurred to affect these species and eventually causing their extinction, you know, well, they, they affected us also. Uh, we were fighting for survival right alongside them. Now, this extinction event was global in scale, but I'm focusing mostly on North America. Um, these images, you know, do a good job portraying what the landscapes would have been like during that time, you know, lots of grasslands. Um, but as we were coming out of the Ice Age and temperatures were warming up, forests uh, began to replace these biomes. Um, so many of these larger species were already struggling to keep up, uh, you know, with the changing climate. And many, you know, did indeed go extinct. But once again, something happened 12,800 years ago that drove that proverbial nail into the coffin for, for a large number of mega mammals that eventually took them out for good. You know, <laughs> animals like the short faced bear, you know, look at this thing. Uh, this thing is twice the size of our modern grizzly bears today, you know, and, and check out this time range, you know, 1.8 million to around 11,000 years ago. This was a very successful predator for a really long time but it did not make it out of our last ice age. The American lion, um, you know, we had lions here, you know, like real lions, just like the African lions of today, but twice their size. Uh, and again, look at their time range, 34,000 years to right around 11,000 years ago. And as a matter of fact, I chose to only highlight megafauna that went extinct around the Younger Dryas timeframe to avoid confusion with other background extinctions that may have occurred previously during the Pleistocene. Um, you can see here the, uh, the Glyptodon, you know, this is an armadillo the size of a buffalo. You know, it was widely successful in North America. The giant ground sloth, you know, here, right here's a picture uh, of my daughter and I next to a replica of one that was found in the marshes close to Savannah, Georgia. You know, it, it was monstrous. It towers over us. These things were giants. Um, we had... We had camels in North America. You know, the, these things were twice the size of our modern day camels at the, at, you know, of the Middle East. Uh, but they were here. They were here in North America and they were here for a really long time. 3.2 million to 10,000 years ago. You know, giant cow sized beavers roamed around for nearly 3 million years. Um, the classic saber tooth tiger, one of my favorites growing up. You know, the Mixotoxodon and the stag moose, you know, and how... How can I leave out the uh, the biggest of the big land mammals, the Colombian mammoth? 
uh, they too fell during the time of the Younger Dryas. You know, and the list goes on and on. Um, again, this extinction event wasn't isolated to just North America. You know, Europe and, and Northern uh, Asia lost species like the cave bear and the woolly rhinoceros. South America lost species like the lip top terna and uh, its own species of glyptodon uh, with a spiky tail. Australia lost a handful of their oversized marsupial species, you know, so this was global. But interestingly enough, the one continent that seems to have made it out of the Younger Dryas relatively untouched uh, and, and still to, to this day has a large collection of its megafauna, like elephants, rhinos, hippos, giraffes, is Africa, um, you know, which is the supposed cradle of humanity. And, you know, speaking of humanity, at least in the case of North America, it has been our own species that has been accredited uh, with the disappearance of all of these other mega mammals. You know, supposedly, as the story goes, savage bands of hunters and gatherers came across the Bering Land Bridge uh, towards the end of the last ice age. They swept across North America and slaughtered every animal they came across. Um, you know, that's just, if, if this were true, then the population of humans in North America would have exploded. I mean, you know, we were <laughs> we, we were snacking on short faced bears and American lions. Right. Uh, but no, that's not what we find. You know, what we do find is evidence of a struggling culture whose time in North America was short lived. You know, the Clovis people were named primarily for the stone atlatl and spear points they used uh, seen here. And, uh, you know, th these were first identified in Clovis, New Mexico, giving them that name uh, and have since been found to exist all over the continent. Um, you know, did they hunt to survive? Well, of course they did. You know, were they capable of wiping out over 73% of our animal species weighing in at over 100 pounds with sticks and stones? And yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, you know, this, this map, this map right up here, um, you know, I find this one to be very uh, interesting, particularly interesting to me because it shows Clovis point finds and pre-Clovis uh, within the area of the Carolina Bays that we have been talking about. And look at this one here. This is, I find this very interesting. Um, this is Gray's Reef. Uh, it's off the coast of Sapelo Island here in Georgia. And this is one of those sites. They've actually found Clovis and, and, and you know, cultural artifacts at that site, at that reef. You know, and there's no reason to believe that the Clovis people would not have had their most densely populated areas along the coast, you know, much like our current population today. Um, but the coastline of the time was 100 miles farther out and 400 feet deeper than where it is today. You know, I can only imagine the history that has yet to be discovered on the ocean floor. And I, and I hope I live long enough to see some of this, uh, you know, with my own eyes. Um, it's also important to point out that we aren't saying that all humans went extinct in North America during this time, uh, but that the culture of the time did, meaning that we find evidence of the Clovis culture below the younger uh, Dryas soil records. Um, like we find evidence of glyptodons and mixotoxodons, um, but above, above that layer, um, the culture drastically changes. You know, we, we no longer find Clovis points, but instead, um, after some time of inactivity uh, has gone by, we start to see stone arrowheads instead. Uh, so once again, you know, what could have occurred for us to see such a sudden drop in large animal species, as well as the culture that has been blamed for their disappearance? Well, earth crossing paths with a highly fragmented comet could do it. You know, a, a, a few of those fragments breaking through our atmosphere, causing multiple air boosts, bursts and extensive fires, um, as well as at least one, but probably multiple, actually making contact with the North American ice sheet, creating tremendous floods and sending humongous ice chunks across the continent that, that will eventually create the Carolina Bays themselves. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, for the next part of the series, I plan to focus on the North American mega floods, our global sea level rise at the end of the uh, last ice age, and some of our cultural observance records that highlight this overall event. You know, things like, um, you know, I don't know, the disappearance of Atlantis, maybe, uh, or maybe extensive rain events for, I don't know, 40 days and 40 nights, maybe. Um, and you know what? If, if you guys think I should split these topics up into two parts instead of uh, one, to allow for more uh, detail, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you guys. And as always, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.